I've met Putin 25 times. And for me, Putin is someone that knows how to measure risk. There is a rationality in his decision making. When I saw him the days before the invasion of Ukraine, I think emotion was stronger than the rational thinking. Now he's expressing a very, very deep frustration and resentment against the West, but not only against the West, against the past, against history. Vladimir Putin has rocked the foundations of European security. Что бы ни пытался помешать нам, а тем более создать угрозы для нашей, то ответ России будет незамедлительным и приведет вас к таким последствиям, с которыми вы в своей истории еще никогда не сталкивались. This is the story of Putin's path to war, how and why he wrong-footed the West through a decade of clashes. Putin said, "I can get away with it. The Americans won't do anything." told by the leaders who've locked horns with him. I said to President Putin that it's not a possible situation. And on that point, I've already seen the past. The mensonge is part of the diplomacy of Vladimir Putin. We should have stood up to him then. That is the truth. And what is happening now in Ukraine is the turning point. As you well know, Ukraine has always been you know, a huge thing for Russia, but the idea of an invasion just wasn't in the discussion at that time. And actually what happened is over as the months were going on, we started the research. First of all, we thought, okay, this is timely. Joe has a much better instinct for what is going to be newsworthy than we do, evidently. But secondly, that it was going to be, it was getting increasingly difficult because, you know, we were having meetings with people and they'd just say, well, things with Russia are looking a little bit dicey. Maybe now's not the perfect time to have this conversation. So it got much, much more difficult as the months went by. And then by the end of the year, we were in this quite odd situation where we knew we had the right series for the right time, but we also knew there's something really big around the corner and it's going to be incredibly difficult to make so, it. So Tim, but by dicey, presumably you mean all the internal political developments in Russia, such as Navalny being arrested? Navalny being arrested, but I think more so for us, because we weren't, do you mean in terms of working in Russia? I mean, the thing is, it's just our access to in Russia was always going to be really limited. We thought, you know, we'd have a go. Um, so Norma and I had sort of maintained a rel relationships, maybe too strong a word, we could get it. We had a way of getting in touch with Dmitry Peskov, who is Putin's spokesperson, the kind of gatekeeper to the Kremlin in terms of the media. And so we knew we could write to him and try and have a discussion with him. But we didn't have any great hope that we'd get much further than basically a pretty flat no. Um, but what was actually becoming much more difficult through the summer into the autumn and then particularly late 2021 was that even the people in the West, even the kind of British, American, European politicians who we thought, right, we've got a much better chance with them, even they were starting to get quite cold feet about talking about this because no one knew what was going to happen. And the one thing that people tend to like to talk about in these things, as to, you know, they like to talk about stories where they know the outcome because otherwise, you know, they can be shown up to be wrong. Okay, so then it happened. Before we discuss your next steps, uh, let's uh, have a, uh, a look at the next clip from the first episode, I think. Putin voulait pas serrer la main devant tout le monde à Poroshenko. Il a préféré aller dans une pièce où euh, il serait certes face à face, mais pas devant euh, l'ensemble de l'opinion internationale. We are 20 minutes before the huge uh, lunch with all the head of state and government, including Her Majesty the Queen. We couldn't afford to be late because normally uh, you do not tell the 
the Queen uh, of England that, uh, sorry, we are a bit late, you have to wait 15 minutes. It, is not, it doesn't work. Putin hated an idea to have this meeting. He tried to do his best to avoid it. And it happened while, like, François Hollande take his hands and accompany him to the room. Hollande had enlisted the German Chancellor's support. We got together in this um, typical French chateau, and um, they were sitting there. It was very crisp. When Putin entered, he said, OK, 10, 15 minutes, no more. Why? Because I have a very busy schedule. OK. I started with the uh, demand for the immediate liberation of the Crimea. Putin said uh, in Russian, he said, ich tam net, which means there is no Russian troops there. And then Angela said, Valodya. She said it in Russian. D don't be stupid, so come on. After less than 20 minutes, the leaders left for the lunch. Nothing substantive had been agreed. Uh, Petro Poroshenko, François Hollande, and all the others, movers and shakers, Boris Johnson and the rest of them. I'm, I'm sure it's a question a lot of people watching this want to, to ask. How do you get to those people? How do, do you make sure they agree to talk to you? How do you make sure that when they sit in front of you, they actually say something meaningful? Um, well, that, that is basically the... That was the intention with this series. Like, you know, that we our brief was get the big people who, you know, get the most important people, the people who are in the room at that moment. And uh it's not easy. It takes time. Um, but I think part of it is just sticking really clearly to that brief. I think what we say to all of those people when we approach them, and I'll talk a bit about sort of step by step how we go about that but I think the key thing to sort of remember is from the start we were really strict there's no presenter in these shows they're very straight kind of it's recent it's you know recent events but told as history we only interview the people who are there there's very little there's no speculation there's no pundits there's not if we don't get someone we don't sort of find a journalist who can tell the story and work them into the story as well we just we were just very very strict with it and I think if you set out to do that from the start and you approach people and you're just very clear with your intention they sort of buy it at the start but yeah a few I mean step by step with this one there's a few things to remember first of all is everyone's question everyone's question is who else is doing it that is the the question that every single person that you approach will ask you and so it's quite important to have a couple of names in the bag as such from the beginning. So what we did with this one is we went back to some of the people that either I or Norma or other people on the team had encountered or interviewed or met for another series. Um, Francois Hollande is a good example of that. He had been in a series that we did about the um, about various crises in the European Union. He'd also been in a series I made about Donald Trump's foreign policy and so and this is you know this was one of his big foreign policy moments was what happened in 2014 so he was one of the first people that we approached and he you know not with you know it wasn't like immediately said yes but he said okay that sounds interesting this is something that I could probably take part in let's keep talking and then that allowed us to then, you know, and a few other people like that, we managed to get on board. And so it meant that when we started having the more difficult conversations with people that we'd never spoken to before, you can at least say, well, look, Francois Hollande's doing it. In that clip, you've got Christophe Huysgen, who was Merkel's diplomatic advisor. And um, yeah, it's not very easy getting, uh, it's not very easy getting German officials to tell the sort of details of their story. I think that, you know, it's, I've tried so many times to try to get Merkel and her people and they just don't, they just won't do it. But on this one, we can say, look, 2014, this was a moment of French and German diplomacy in action. 
Francois Hollande's doing it, surely the Chancellor would like to do it as well. But um, it's, you know, it's it's just even getting to the point where you can make that argument is quite difficult. So the first thing, and it sounds really sort of basic, but honestly, we just write really, really formal letters to everybody. And I think that's, you know, it, there's a in a lot of television in particular, it's, you know, it's a lot of getting on the phone and chasing people and building up relationships that way. But I think when it does come to certain very senior people, actually a very formal letter with a very formal bid that their researcher, assistant, whoever it is, can put on their desk and say, yeah, actually, I got this through today. These people look serious. They look like they know what they're doing is pretty important. So we write very formal letters that hopefully opens up the possibility of just getting a foot in the door and then telling them who else is doing it and saying, look, you want your voice to be in this as well. So that was, that's what you would normally do. That's what we did here. But I think the complicating factor here is that the story, even though we're talking about events 10 years in the past, the story felt like one that was very, very current. And people were a little bit concerned about talking about Ukraine because they didn't know what was going to happen next. Um, so yeah, that was how we, that's how we started. I mean, I wrote, you know, the other factor in this is that, um, you know, I have been doing this for a fair while. Norma has been doing this for many decades. And so the other thing that you can do is say, people we have interviewed in the past include everyone from Barack Obama to uh, Bill Clinton to, you know, it, 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 we can have a very long list of people that we've interviewed in the past. And that does actually help just a little bit of playing up your reputation. But we put all of that in a pretty formal letter. You know, it's sort of this, it's not a, it's not a friendly, like, get out your little black book and phone up someone and say, come on, will you do this? It's very, very, uh, yeah, it's a very formal approach in the first instance. Um, just very briefly, Tim, uh, obviously not everyone has the same kind of experience and, and, and the same kind of phone book as you do. Uh, what would be your uh, advice to somebody who, who's just starting off or has just started off and and wants to interview somebody really really senior and important it's a really good question i was thinking about that ahead of today actually and i think i think it's just don't um don't downplay how serious your endeavor is i think you know actually go into do your research really thoroughly so one thing is look at what they've said in the past what they like talking about is a really important thing to maybe include in that bid. It, you know, your the interview that you eventually conduct will cover all sorts of things. But just with this one, we knew that Francois Hollande, for example, is very proud of his achievements at the Minsk talks and he writes about them in his book. And we so we read the relevant chapter in his book. And in the letter mentioned, you know, we would like to interview about, for example, XYZ that you did, you know, that happened at Minsk. And appealing to those things that people would like to talk about is really important um and also just if you don't necessarily have something to draw on in terms of we have done this in the past really play up your ambition for it you know say this is going to be a big landmark moment or a big landmark series and we are approaching people like xyz because you know you can exaggerate that not you know be realistic but if you have if you are saying you know we are hoping to speak to various other people at your level that's another good way of just opening the door they'll be intrigued enough perhaps to allow that next step of the conversation but definitely spend the time figuring out what people want to talk about and use that as a way and would be my one bit of advice okay thanks for that before moving on uh let's watch our next clip I get back from Kiev, and the following day, I got Putin on the blur again. And, uh, and this is a, a this is a very long call and a most extraordinary call. 
he was being very, very familiar. I said to him, look, uh, if you do this, it will be an utter uh, catastrophe. It will mean a massive package of, of Western sanctions. Uh, it will mean we continue to uh, intensify our support for, uh, for Ukraine. And it will mean more NATO, not less NATO, on your borders. And he said, you say, he said, Boris, you, you say that uh, Ukraine is, is not going to join NATO anytime soon. He said it in English, anytime soon. What is anytime soon? And I said, well, it, it, it's not going to join NATO for the foreseeable future. Uh, you know that perfectly well. It, it, it fundamentally, it wasn't about, you know, he, he sort of, he threatened me at one point and said, you know, uh, Boris, I don't want to hurt you, but uh, with a missile, it would only take a minute or something like that, you know. Uh, you know, jolly. Uh, but I think from the, the very relaxed tone that he was taking, uh, the sort of air of detachment that he seemed to have, he was just playing along uh, with my attempts to get him to negotiate. Wow. So that was uh, one of your bombshells, wasn't it? Uh, Put in threatening Boris. Um, so you've got your uh, interviewees. What next? How, how do you prepare? How do you make sure it, it's not just them going through the motions? How do you make sure that they say something like this, something that will be news in itself? Because because that statement, the Kremlin was forced to react to, to, to what Boris said. How do you achieve all this? Um, so... Yeah, that was an unusual, that made an unusual splash for these series. I mean, it's it's because they really do feel quite often like history series. Uh, we don't always get that big bombshell that makes it into the press. And actually the sort of what makes them feel a bit different is not so much people saying things that they've, abs no one's ever heard before. It's just them saying it on camera. This one was a bit different. But I think in general, the way that you get people to engage with these interviews in a very different way is to conduct them in a slightly different way to a news interview. We're very, they're really meticulously prepared and also prepared in advance with the office of the person that we're interviewing. So with the Boris Johnson interview, for example, we, again, spent, we, we I think we got his interview, you know, he was actually, you know, he was prime minister when we started the series and then he suddenly wasn't. And we, that allowed us the opportunity to get the interview. But with him, we would send, you know, we trawled through every interview he'd given on Ukraine. It was quite late on. So we'd already interviewed several other people and they, we could sort of put to him, look, this is what this person said. But we sent a pretty detailed, and this is what we tried to do ahead of every interview for the series, is send a pretty detailed kind of, briefing document to them saying look here's something that you said we'd like you to say something similar to that here's something that somebody else has said in a filmed interview we'd like to hear your side of the story for that moment and, and it's less of a kind of right of reply accusatory thing it's simply this is somebody's memory of this does it frick your memory do you remember this so some of them they had an idea of what you were going to ask they, them. they had a really good idea and i think it's it's actually and it's that that allows these interviews to feel a bit different. I mean, you know, our, you've seen series, our questions aren't in it, there's no presenter. And actually what you're trying to do with the interview is less get them to respond to your questions and more just sit there and tell a story. You know, so the quest, so what we want them to do is the, the you know, the briefing document that we'd send them would be something like, you know, at this date on this, at this place, this meeting happened. Can you tell us about your memories? And then we just have a few quotes underneath that of things that people had said in the past. And then when we're actually sat in the chair, that's very much what the question would be. I, I was doing that Boris Johnson interview and he's, I've never interviewed him before and I had no idea what he'd be like. And I actually didn't, you know, he doesn't have a reputation for preparing very thoroughly for things. And so I thought he'd never have looked at this document we'd sent, we'd sent him. But in fact, he obviously had and had obviously thought through like that revelation about the missile. My sense is that it was something that he wanted to say ahead of the interview. And he was sort of he was prepared to say it and had chosen this interview as the moment he was going to 
declare that this happened. So we'd sent him, we, what we did know is we knew that that phone call happened and we'd read a s shorter report of roughly what had been said on the phone call. So that was in a briefing document. And then the question in the interview would literally be me saying, so a few days later, you speak to Putin, tell us about that call. And then, you know, that's it. And you just want him to take it over because we have the edit to cut it down. We have other interviews to make it work with. We know that, you know, if he gives us an eight minute long answer, it's not such a problem in the way that it is in a news interview. So just giving people as, as much sort of advanced information as possible without, you know, you don't want to say this is literally how it breaks down. We wouldn't ever tell someone what happened, what anybody else had told us off the record. And it's not quite saying these are literally what the questions have got to be. There's got to be a bit of spontaneity and it's got to be, be a bit of a conversation. But in general, give them a good lead in, let them kind of prepare if they have the inclination to. And then just have lots of information for them to respond to. The thing that, I mean, I've occasionally sent people in advance like a video of a meeting or some pictures of a meeting to help prompt their memory. You know, it, I don't think we did with Boris Johnson, but in the Trump series, there was a very iconic photo of lots of world leaders at a G7 summit, kind of all sort of leaning over Donald Trump, who's just sitting back like that with his arms crossed. And we sent that photo to the kind of four or five people that we'd managed to get who were in the room just to sort of just ahead of the meeting and just got them to, you know, the prompt was just think us, think us, think yourself back to that moment and tell us what it was like. And that's really what you're trying to do. You know, these you're trying to just get people to recreate those moments. So doing that, but also then it's all very well to be super prepared, but then you do have to be able to just respond when something does, someone does say something completely unexpected, like Boris Johnson talking about his missile, you have to, treaded sort of delicate balance between not turning it into a just saying something like okay so what happened next and what was the next thing and just trying to get you through that conversation but yeah it's trying to get them to be as comfortable as possible is the absolute key for these interviews um so that was that was how we did that one and it doesn't always work with people poroshenko who was in the other one had obviously not read or looked at anything that we sent him so with him we asked the first question he just went off on a sort of big speech about you know the history of ukraine and it was it was and himself as well and um it was really tricky and we had to kind of pause after the first answer and say okay thank you for that and then actually just stop the interview not quite stop the interview but just say look what we're looking for here is a slightly different style of interview and actually explain to people, look, this is what we're looking for. Because I think the other thing to remember is that once someone like that has agreed to do it, they have one thing, which is they want to make sure they're actually in it. And they want to make sure that they get as much screen time as possible once they've decided to do it. So if you say to them, look, what works really well in these interviews is direct speech and actually just reporting a conversation. People always sit up and listen when they hear you say, I said to Vladimir Putin, Next. they're going to listen to what you say next and just using little prompting them through it with things like that is good because you know all these people are smart enough to know that they are going to come across better in the program if they play the game as opposed to avoiding your question or not listening to you but it doesn't always work and Poroshenko was funny because he it started off so badly and we were doing it over zoom because he was in Ukraine we couldn't go to Ukraine at that time and we all kind of, I was the only person he could see and everyone else in the room who was listening in was just like, oh my God, this is terrible, what's going on? And, um, but he just, after, and then the, he, the first prompt, he just did the same thing again. And then the third question, for some reason, he just, it just clicked and he gave a really brilliant answer about going to the White House to go and see Donald Trump. And actually after that, again, we sort of paused it and said, you know what you just said there, that was absolutely perfect. That's exactly the right style. And the rest of the interview went brilliantly. He just got it and he every single answer after that was fine. So it's it's about, yeah, you just, you know, these people are quite directable. I think it can be quite easy to think, oh my gosh, big president. But 
they just all they want to do is come across well so if you tell them how to do that it helps yeah i was going to ask you tim what's your recipe for not being uh intimidated by the the high and mighty of this world um that's <laughs> It's a good question. I was terrified the first time I did a TV interview. I remember it was on a or it's an interview for a documentary like this because, yeah, you're the one thing that you don't always have with these people is a lot of time. You know, that's that is actually what's difficult is figuring out. You know, for all of the fact that you want to let them give a nice long story telling answer, you've only got say half an hour, forty minutes with someone. You've got twenty questions, and you're just not going to get through everything. So it's a bit of a bounce and I was terrified the first time I sat down and interviewed so the first interview I did at least for one of these big history series was um the British ambassador to Iraq and it was uh, yeah it's kind of I think I was you know it's just uh, maybe I was an AP at that point in time I was quite junior in the in the production and um my what I kept doing in that interview is I kept looking at my questions and I just kept kind of checking things off and I kept doing that. And I think that was my way of sort of not quite engaging with it. But actually, my thing is just um, just just look at them and actually just listen as much as you can. You know, you've already done all the prep. They've got the questions. You've got the questions. You kind of know how this is, you know, this is a, they've agreed to do it by this point. They just want to come across as well as possible and look at them. And that means that when they say something good, you know, when to smile or, you know, when to nod, or, you know, when something's really good and just keep that focus. That was my thing. The other thing is run through it beforehand, but not too much so that you're not absolutely terrified about, you know, you're not trying to remember a script too much. So we have, you know, that document that we may have sent them with loads of detail in it. And normally for a big interview, I'll probably run through it with the team just beforehand. And I'll say, okay, well, what I'm planning on asking here is this, or the answer we really want to get is that. And But the danger there is that if you sort of over-rehearse your questions, they become really long and that's not what you want. You just want a nice short question. So being just glancing at your questions to saying, okay, so the next thing is X, Y, Z, and then just not looking down and not looking at your questions too much. So you know what you want to get through, but you're not trying to stick too tightly to a script. Um, but to be totally frank, it's just doing it more and more. You become a bit more relaxed with each one and it's fine to be terrified at the beginning. There's absolutely nothing wrong with it. It's natural. And a little bit of that is good. I mean, the Zelensky interview that we got for this series was, uh, it felt like a big deal. You know, I was really edgy doing that one. And um, I, you know, we only had one shot. We didn't have very long with him. And I felt really quite, uh, yeah, I felt pretty nervous with that one. And I wasn't quite sure how to phrase things with him because he's a president at war it's a very different situation to sitting in a big london drawing room with boris johnson it's you know it's it's different um but actually for that one just credit to him he's an amazing communicator and just calmed everyone in the room down the minute he started speaking because he has a really great ability to just sort of engage the room and from the first answer that we knew that that would be a good interview i think okay let's see the next clip 24 hours after addressing the UN, Timmermans confronted his fellow EU foreign ministers. He wanted sanctions to hit Russia's key sectors, like energy and banking, even if this meant European economies suffered. I said, if we don't react now, the Russians will interpret this as sort of a, a carte blanche to do even more. Straight away, um, it was clear that there were two extremes in the room, that on the one hand, the Poles, the Baltic states, as usual, um, taking a very, very tough line on um, Russia. At the other end of the scale, some of the Southern Europeans being much more reluctant to move forward. I said, well, uh, surely you don't want to be the one to prevent our unity from being clear 
how are you going to explain to your media that, that you don't want us to impose sanctions? Most countries didn't and probably still don't feel threatened by Russia. When a Lithuanian or even a Pole says something about Russia, they are skeptical. But when a really cool, rational uh, Dutchman says it, it, it has a greater effect on the Western Europeans. There were member states who, I think at that time, were feeling we'd done enough, or maybe it was time to relax our position. Nobody suggested that, having listened to France. We've got our first question, uh, which uh, comes from Nick, um, who's asking, was it ever a concern that giving people such detailed advance warning might lead to them preparing heavily embellished or even false answers? Yes, that is a really good question. And we, we do have to be quite careful in, in that. Um, that is where I find you just have to really trust your research and also where this style of filmmaking, where you are interviewing quite a few people about each event really is really important because one, one kind of rule that we have is that we just, if someone lies, it's not quite like a news night interview where you would say, hang on, I'm going to pick you up on that and you're lying. Actually, what would happen is if someone has said something that isn't in keeping with what we think happened in terms of our research, what all of the other interviews have told us, what everybody else that we've, you know, all people that we've spoken to off the record have told us, we just wouldn't use it. And that's where we, that's actually, that's, that's the way that we deal with people who either deliberately or sort of, you know, just get either deliberately lie or just get something wrong. Um, but actually, I find more often than not, giving that advance warning actually does make sure that people stick a bit closer to the truth. It's this, that clip that we just watched is exactly the sort of thing that I like doing in these because you've got four or five people who are there at that particular moment. And um, there's this thing of, you know, someone might, if two people are describing a meeting, someone might say, well, I walked into the room and I gave a long and eloquent speech and the entire room was in, they were just, they were, they were hanging off my every word. And you'd speak to somebody else there who says, oh God, he walked in and he just went on and on and on. And we all had to sit there and wait. And somewhere in between the two of them, you'll figure out what actually happened. And actually what we try to do in this series with this style of history film is to try to get those people to, um, to sort of actually find that meeting point in the middle where you feel like actually, yeah, that does all of those things tally so much that that feels about right. And that scene that we just watched of that European Council meeting, I think is quite good. Timmermans describes the way he put it. Not everyone listened in exactly the same way, but what everyone does agree on is they kind of got there in the end. It becomes a bit more difficult when, and it was more challenging with this one, where you have the conversations with Russians, with Putin or with other Russians, because we simply weren't always able to do what we did pretty much everywhere else and speak to the other side of the conversation. But with that Boris Johnson clip, for example, we thought, well, look, we have no reason to think he's lying. We did check it with him. He was, you know, stood by everything in that interview. And when Dmitry Peskov, the Kremlin chief spokesperson said, actually, he's got it wrong. That's something for them to kind of thrash out. We sort of thought in that instance, this, you know, Boris Johnson has said this, it's kind of in our interest as documentary makers, as historians or journalists, or however you want to look at it, to just put it out there. So there is a danger that people will embellish always, but I think you just have to back your own research. And um, and we do try to really, th I mean, we've got, a, you know, it says the team that we work with, I was the series director. We had two other really experienced, well, quite experienced producer directors. We had a researcher. We had a Ukrainian researcher. We had lots of people who would sort of really, really thoroughly fact check everything. And um, if something that someone said just didn't fit, we would probably not put it in. But there's someone who 
is really important and who is not in your film, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. Did you even try approach him? Mm -hmm. How do you go about answering this really important question of what's going on in, inside his head? It's it, with difficulty, but it was absolutely a guiding principle the whole way through, uh, somehow to get a sense of what was driving him. I mean, one thing actually I sort of I failed to talk about at the beginning is that what we realised when the invasion happened, and we were just on the brink of filming, is that the series we were making was not a film about how the West deals with Putin so much as a film about how did we get here. That's the that was what it was, and. Obviously, the big question there is, so what made Putin do this? And that's something that we are, you know, historians will discuss for many years and journalists will debate, are still debating. But what we thought we can do is we, we've got this unique-ish ability to, to speak to all of these people who have actually encountered him. And it's why we chose that clip of Barroso as the very first thing you hear in the, in the very first programme is someone saying, I've spoken to Putin dozens of times because that is really what we could do in this series. We could hear from the people who have looked Putin in the eye and said, and get a sense of him through that. It's not ideal. Um, you, we would far, you know, we would far rather have interviewed Putin himself, but when it became clear that that wasn't going to happen, yeah, we just had to rely on what he'd said to other people. And by piecing enough of that together, try to get a sense of it. We managed to get one Russian official for this, Andre Kellen, who's the um, ambassador in London, who was very much, it wasn't getting inside Putin's head so much as getting the kind of official Russian position on some of this stuff across. It was an interesting and quite illuminating interview. Um and amazing being in his residence in the middle of the war. I mean, it was kind of quite eerie. There was no one there apart from him and um, about six people, like staff, who poured you tea in a silver teapot wearing white gloves. I mean, it was very strange circumstances. But yeah, it, it, that interview was just... In fact, in terms of that question about lies, that interview felt like he said a lot of things which we just knew weren't true. But we kind of put it out, we kept some of it in the documentary because it was so ridiculous. You know, talking about the Salisbury poisonings, for example, he said things like, well, it was nothing to do with us. And obviously he had, there was this quite terrifying moment where he said, you know, if we really wanted to hurt someone, we could just make them disappear. And he sort of waved his hand like that. And, you know, you're sitting six feet from this person and it felt quite terrifying. But that's a... You know, that is an untruth, a lie, a distortion of the truth, whatever it is. But it just felt so outrageous that it made the cut. Um, but yeah, that was so we only had one Russian official and then a lot of people who had been in a room with Putin. And that's what we tried to use. OK, let's see the next clip. A month later, when Putin arrived in the UK for a G8 summit, the mood was shifting. The West had just gone public with accusations that Assad's forces were using chemical weapons in Syria, and there were growing calls for military intervention. We took Putin upstairs to the study that had been Margaret Thatcher's office and had Margaret Thatcher's painting on the wall. Putin said, ah, oh, truly she was an iron lady. And then in this very confined space, that room's small and we're all sort of knee to knee, huddled around having this meeting, they got down to business. Cameron said, if chemical weapons are used in Syria and we have evidence they're beginning to be used, the world cannot stand by. And Putin said, what is this evidence? It's worthless. We haven't forgotten Iraq. We haven't forgotten Colin Powell at the UN. And then there was a moment where, to me, in the room, Putin just seemed to lose patience with all of this. And I had a notebook in my pocket at that meeting to, to record what was said. This, this is actually the notebook, but uh, I noted it down and in the margin in a very quiet voice. And Putin said, I know you're a great country with a great history and you all think I'm not democratic like you. I won't argue with you. I'm an ex-KGB man. I'm wicked and scary with claws and teeth and you're all so well-bred and so well-educated. 
But you remember Abu Ghraib, David? Did you see those pictures? It was medieval what happened there. To get what you want in Syria, it'll have to be the same again. You've interviewed your movers and shakers, your high mighty. Uh, now the challenge is bringing it all together in a way that makes sense and forms a narrative. How do you do that? Um, so one thing I didn't say is ahead of the interviews, what we've done is from the minute we started researching this, and they, these are long productions, or so this this was, you know, one thing we did have on this is time. But we've, I kind of, I like to keep essentially a kind of working script of sorts from the very beginning that you're sort of trying to hit. And so that feels like quite a kind of rough outline story beats document right at the beginning. But as you speak to people, you start to flesh it out with, okay, well, look, we've got this person who might say this at this moment in time. We've got this person lined up who might say that. What I, but suddenly you go through this sort of couple of months where you film loads of interviews and you've just got endless sort of versions of these stories. The thing that, we try to do though is to keep that story structure pretty tight from the start so we knew exactly with the first episode certainly the main arc that we wanted to hit and the interviews are structured accordingly the the next thing that i that we try to do is make sure that when we actually conduct those interviews that they're working with interviews that we've already shot so again if we know that uh, Franz Timmermans has described one meeting. We'll try to make sure that everyone else that we're speaking to either fills in the blanks from where he of things that he hasn't spoken about, or we will just make sure that they kind of cut together quite nicely in the end. But it's I think the first rough cut of this was something like two and a half hours long. I mean, it was it was a beast, and you just try to whittle down those stories that people tell in the edit um the difficulty always comes when someone says that really unexpected gem in an interview and you think oh okay right now we've got to be you know you have to put it in but you've got a slightly rejig structure um but you know we we kind of deal with that the other big aspect of these films is the archive footage which is really really key to making you actually feel that you're there so again, with that working script that we've had from the start, there'll be little notes of kind of these are the key moments where we know there are really good pictures and we'll try to build the archive into it from the start. So one of the early scenes in the series, the first big scene, in fact, is the, there was a summit in Vilnius in to, late 2013, which kind of set things in motion for the Maidan revolution. And there's this extraordinary video that... Um, the hosts took where they kind of go around a drinks reception and everyone all of the leaders are talking about this bombshell that the Ukraine then Ukrainian president Yanukovych had dropped at the summit and we knew that that would be a really good spine for that scene so all of the interviews that we asked them about things to do with this video so that we knew that we'd be able to work them together in the edit um but I think at the end of the day, you've just got to keep remembering that you're telling, you need to be able to tell this as a story. And you can, you know, there's only so much detail that people can keep. So it can sort of take on before you need to get back to, okay, and what happens next? Um, we did try to keep it very tightly chronological. You know, there's these are complicated enough subjects as it is. So messing around with timelines becomes you know it's just an added complication so we were quite sort of the edit is not you know the storytelling is quite straight in those terms but you know it's it you just try to put it together as best you can and the other thing is at that stage you've probably got I don't know 60 hours of interview that you've got to try to wade through so a lot of it is just working through the transcripts and making sure you've absolutely got the best bits which is you know takes time as well the edits aren't hugely long but what we tried to do or i tried to do with these with this one was 
spend a good few weeks ahead of the edit just really refining down what the best bits were and working in there but the the interview driver i mean that is ultimately what it comes down to so we've got a pretty good idea beforehand but the interviews are the driver прокинулась вночі з дружиною і сім'єю з дітьми я сказав дружині будьте готові до то просто ти повинна сказати дітям, що у нас почалась війна. Ми це від... ну, тобто це було зрозуміло вже в цей момент. І поясни дітям, як пояснити, запитала мене дружина, поясни, як є, бо, бо вони повинні розуміти. Я поїхав в офіс, я приїхав в офіс, я був першим в офісі. Ми почали працювати. question about a very uh, closely related subject and uh, by the way now is the time to ask your questions uh, if you want us to answer them before we uh, wrap up so the question comes from Alex who asks how do you approach structuring the episode and how reactive is that to what you get from the interviews um, yeah it's so as I was saying do you, we have a a pretty good outline from the start you know first of all you read all the books that you can read all the articles get a pretty good sense of the story but and sort of have a you know an outline which would be in the initial proposals that you might talk to the BBC about but every time you meet someone whether it's for a quick off the record discussion or a quick or a filmed interview you update it and you you try to sort of work the most interesting bits from that meeting into that structure and i think it's just a constant refining is what you're doing along the way so every time you shoot an interview you think oh yeah that would be a really good one and i you know someone might mention something in an interview that you hadn't quite thought about or describe it in a different way so they might describe the fact that it was a rainy evening when they were on their way to this meeting and so then i'd get in touch with the archive producer and say Actually, have you got some exteriors of that of that particular event where it was raining? And you just constantly sort of bit by bit refining it. But if you're not reactive, you I think there is a real danger that you can sort of approach this like a sort of quite scripted, authored documentary where you're just looking to get interviews to fit your thesis. And you have to totally reverse that thinking. And if someone says something really interesting, run with it and go with it. Okay, my final question. Uh, what are you working on now? So uh, this was, um, yeah, it was it was successful. You know, these these series sometimes do well in terms of viewing figures. Sometimes they do well in terms of reviews. This one got good reviews, good news coverage, and pretty good viewing figures as well. So um, almost immediately, the BBC said. We need to know what happens next. So I am currently making another two parts of, it might be parts four and five of this series. It might be a new two part. We haven't quite worked that one out, but it is what happened. It's the first year of the war. Well, the first year of the full scale war, the year after the invasion. And it's an interesting one for me because we're doing it a lot more. We're doing it at greater pace than last time because we want to get it out sooner rather than later but also it's interesting building on the previous series you know unlike last time where we are starting from totally afresh this time we're going back to quite a few of the people that we spoke to so we're interviewing Zelensky again we'll interview probably interview Bo yeah we will interview Boris Johnson again Ben Wallace various other people so hopefully it will tell the story of that first year in order to get a sense of just how the war has changed the world. That's the idea. But uh, 
it's all the same it's even though we're doing this one in nearly half the time it's all those same principles apply so we're right now writing dozens of letters our ap is actually next door with a really long list of people to write to and they're just going through doing the kind of formal letters that i was talking about hopefully in the next month we'll meet as many of those people as possible off the record and then June, July, we'll start sitting down and doing those interviews. But all of it, it's exactly the same. It doesn't matter if you've just come off the back of a really successful series. You still have to start that letter with a kind of, we're doing a really big, important history, and you should be part of it. That's the initial pitch. And we've got a question from Catherine, who asks, can you give us an idea of how much time you spend on each phase of the documentary e.g original research interviewing pre-edit finding your key bits editing and any other phases i might know i might not know about that's ah, good um good question it was so we started full production sort of summer 2021 so it's about a year and a half the total production and it, it ramped up a little bit we brought some more people onto the team about six months in but that first six months, we didn't touch a camera. That was purely research. It was There was no filming. And I think it was actually February that we were due to start filming. And then because of the invasion, we decided actually we just need to take a step back for a few weeks. So it's probably eight months of nothing to do with filming, just researching and refining the sort of pre-filming script. Then about three months was our shooting window you know it's not like a sort of we don't get on the road and go and shoot things day after day a lot of the people we're approaching are quite hard to pin down for a particular time so you just got to have quite a wide shooting window do what you can within that and then while during that shooting window we're doing a lot of pre-edit scripting as each interview comes in we're getting those scripts ready for the edit and then the edits were a 11 weeks I think each of the edits so um, with about a three or four week stagger in between them so the first one starts the second one starts a few weeks later the third one starts a bit after that um, so it was a good chunk of time we spent on it and each of those phases is quite generous but the one thing I would say is they're not very strict. So we were still filming loads of the interviews well into the edits. There wasn't a moment where the filming window shut and then it was the edit because there are still lots of people that we want to get. You know, it's not, again, you sort of, Zelensky, for example, yeah, I think it was, was it October or maybe even November when we got him and we were finished filming in December. So really late on and had to respond to that. A few of the other very big interviews came in very late. Um, yeah, it was so the a, a very, very large amount of time at the beginning when you're just researching it, a shorter filming window, and then everyone always wants more time in the edits, but um, yeah, a, a reasonable, but you know, a reasonably generous edit. What you do, is it um, history or journalism? Um, we interestingly we say i've used history quite a lot in this um talk i realized and um yeah we always say history in our letters and i think that that helps with the access a bit but i also think it's interesting because i think having that slight distinction helps the style as well because one thing that we thought about when the invasion started is, oh gosh, this, this is a story about what's happening now. How are we going to deal with that in the style where you're asking people to tell you about what happened, i.e. what happened in the past? So we were we decided pretty early on that our last scene was going to be the night of the invasion. We wouldn't go beyond that point. And similarly with this story that we're doing, what, what I'm doing right now, we've decided that we're just going to tell the story of the first year so that you don't get into that what's happening now and let alone what might happen in the future um and i think they become history series but they are history series that require an awful lot of journalism to get them right so i don't know some somewhere in between but if i was offering i hadn't thought about it but a good bit of advice is pitch them as, as this is securing your place in history not talk to me i'm a scary journalist 
what a note to end this on. Tim, thank you very much for talking to us. I, I found it fascinating. Um, and good luck in your new endeavours. Thank you very much. Thanks for thanks for having me. And thanks everyone for coming along. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to join in to say thank you so much to Vitaly and Tim. I, I really hope you all enjoyed it. It was a fantastic conversation. Apologies for the technical glitches. Entirely my fault. Uh, but thank you to Tim and Vitaly for behaving as though everything was going beautifully smoothly. Um, thanks for joining us, everyone, and uh, really appreciate your time this evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye.